Hello, my name is John Horton. This is uh, a paper about sponsored search advertising, and uh, it's joint work with Joe Golden. Arguably one of the most consequential papers uh, in the advertising space that's been published in the last few years was uh, this paper by Chris Nosko, Steve Tadellis, and Tom Blake, where they did this really neat experiment with eBay's marketing. And, you know, the high level takeaway of that that paper is it was at least for eBay sponsored search ads didn't seem to to work and uh, Ray Fisman wrote a little article in the Harvard Business Review um, kind of with the, the question did eBay just prove that paid search ads don't work and at least according to their study the answer is um, yes uh, but you know there, there's you know as the authors of that paper would be the first to admit um, this, this was specific to the eBay context, and all of that um, context might matter. So eBay is a, a well-known retailer. Um, it seems like it's very likely that a lot of the clicks that they were getting on their ads maybe would have come through, through other channels. So what we do in this paper is we essentially redo the uh, Nosco, Tadellis, and Blake paper. Uh, running an experiment with the firm where they shut off their advertising in, in half of the, the markets they were advertising in. And what's innovative about this paper beyond giving us another data point about sponsored search advertising is that this experiment was run uh, deliberately by the firm that knew it was likely going to merge with its largest rival. And what was nice about this is is the experiment allows us to look and see, okay, what did it do to the experimenting firm's business? But we can also turn around and then look and see what did it do to the firm that they were competing with. Um, and so we, 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 this merger allows us to measure the effects of firm various experiment, not just on its, its own business, but on, on the business of its rival. So to give you some background, the two firms were both online service marketplaces. Uh, they use, both use sponsored search ads to acquire new buyers in their respective marketplaces. And these two firms, uh, without revealing who they are, they were extremely close competitors you know, to the point where when they eventually merged, they just switched all of the business over to the to one of the firm, uh, one of the two firms. You know, essentially that the, the feeling was that both the buyers and sellers in that marketplace would be just as happy or nearly as happy conducting their transactions on this alternative marketplace. And these were both, uh, both firms were heavy spenders on Google sponsored search advertising uh, on the order of a million dollars a month. And what they were bidding on was uh, each other's brand names as keywords. So they were doing some brand advertising and as well as a, a large number of business related keywords. So things related to what this, these two marketplaces specialized in. Um, and, and talking to the, to the two firms and um, both uh, my co-author Joe and myself were employees of these firms at the time this experiment was run. Uh, both firms were, were heavily concerned with losing market share to the rival. Uh, both kind of perceived that there was some zero-sumness here and that these markets were characterized by network effects and losing, losing uh, a customer to a rival hurts more than just the foregone revenue from, from, from that particular customer. And so how the experiment was run, Firm Vary was advertising in, in all of the direct marketing areas in the United States, and they randomly assigned uh, the ones in white are in the treatment and the ones in, in gray here uh, are in the control. So first we'll consider the effect of Firm Vary's experiment on its own business. So if we break up and look at each uh, DMA where they were advertising in, uh, the firm from Vary can see how many new customer signups come from that DMA per day. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use that as the outcome. And then we'll have an indicator uh, down below, ads off, which is whether or not sponsored search, sponsored search ads were turned off in that DMI, DMAI on day T. And so uh, when we do that, we actually use a quasi Poisson maximum likelihood um, rather than doing logs, but you can interpret these essentially as percentage changes. And you can see when they turn their advertising off, 
in a DMA, they got about 23% fewer signups that day. Um, if you look at the what this implies about the efficiency of their ads, so the, the implied efficiency rate for ads is about 63%. So what that means is only about 27% of signups from a paid ad click would have come in anyway through some other channels. Now, what we can also do is look at the number of new customer signups per direct marketing area for firm fixed. And so the DMAs are the same. We have the same counts of new customers uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. And so what we would expect is if, if firm vary was taking customers away, uh, was sort of splitting customers with firm fixed, with firm vary out of the way, uh, firm fixed should see a bump. And uh, we don't. So we essentially see a, a fairly precisely estimated zero. Uh, we don't see firm fixed picking up a lot of new business or really any, any detectably um, additional business. So this was uh, surprising. And so now we're going to dig into some of the campaign details to see if we can understand why this was the case. Before we get into the details of the, uh, the ad campaigns, it's important to just to highlight the difference between the two kinds of ads. So for uh, on the left here, we have non-brand sponsored search ads. So for example, just if someone's searching for the word laptop and uh, you can see Dell's advertisement comes up, um, you compared to the right, we have a brand sponsored search ad where the name Dell uh, is explicitly there. And you know, people have drawn a distinction between these two, two ads, two kinds of, of keyword searches for good reason. Um, you know, we think that maybe the one on the right is far more likely to be navigational, but uh, I just want to kind of emphasize that distinction because the results I'm going to present on the campaigns are going to kind of differ pretty strongly by what kind of ad we're talking about. We're going to look at the effect of ad suspension on the campaigns of Firm Fixed. So in terms of predictions, we would expect that for brand ads, if Firm Fixed was also bidding on its, its keyword, its brand name, which we know that they were. Uh, if they were if they were not in the first position, right? If, if firm vary was the one in the first position, we should expect them to move up by almost exactly one. It's now firm firm uh, firm vary is going to be out of the way. For non-brand ads, it really depends on to what extent firm fix was above firm vary in the auctions where they were actually uh, competing in. And so uh, how we can look at this, we can start just graphically. Um, this here on the y-axis here, we have the difference in average position in uh, DMA of firm fixes ads by treatment assignment. And so to the left here, this is before the, uh, before the experiment begins. We can see really there's, there's no difference between the treatment and control as we would expect. Um, then the experiment begins. Uh, we have an unfortunate problem with our data that there was a distributed denial of service attack that makes data unavailable for this period. Um, it's a, an attack levied against firm vary. Uh, but then if we go out where we actually have some usable data again, you can see it bounces around a little bit. But the point estimate is, is pretty close uh, to negative one. And so, you know, what happened here was this is what ads looked like in a treated DMA where firm vary was on top, firm fix was below. So the brand we're talking about here is firm vary was, was bidding more aggressively than firm fix on its, its brand name. Then firm vary shuts off its advertising, disappears from the market, and firm fix moves up by one position. It goes from two to one, so it's a negative, negative effect. For non-brand ads, uh, we see a, essentially a visually imperceptible change. It doesn't look like they moved at, at all. So to get a little more traction with this, it's going to be useful to switch to a regression framework. So here, uh, similar to the first regressions I showed you, the outcome here is uh, going to be a position in a DMA on a given day, and we have an indicator for ads off in that DMA. And so this is this is the the uh, the top panel here is brand ads, and this is the position of firm fixes brands ad brand ads, and so you can see its position 
uh, here it, the effect is negative, meaning it moves from, from 2 to 1, uh, so it goes up almost 1, which is what we predicted. Now if we look for non-brand ads, um, the effect is conventionally significant, they just had a slightly better position, so it, it was not a large improvement in, in the position uh, for their non-brand ads. Now the prediction for what should happen to clicks, um, to the extent that an ad is moved up closer to the top, we should expect it to be clicked on more frequently. Uh, we already know for the non-brand ads, because there was so little change in the position, this isn't likely to be true. Uh, but for brand ads, because they actually did move up, we should expect more clicks. Uh, however, when we actually run the regression, so these are clicks on firm fixed ads, which we know uh, moved up into the top position, um, you know, we, we basically have a, an effect that goes the wrong way. It's actually negative, um, albeit fairly imprecise. Uh, if we go to non-brand ads, nothing seems to happen, but recall the position really didn't, didn't change very much here. Uh, in terms of cost per click, you know, because of the auction format that, that happens, the prediction for brand ads is that the cost should remain the same, um, and, and that just is the, a function of the fact that firm varies ads. Uh, shouldn't that, that wasn't pinning down the price since they were in the first position. Um, for non-brand ads, to the extent they actually moved in, in position, to the extent that uh, firm varies ads were marginal and were, were pinning down the price that they were paying, they should decrease substantially. Um, we actually here have for brand ads, the, the sign is wrong. Uh, it, it looks like the cost per click actually goes up, albeit it's, it's somewhat imprecise. For, for the non-brand ads, the uh, cost per click goes down by a small amount, uh, which is what we would expect to happen, but it is a fairly small effect. Um, so if we look at these cost per click results where we saw an increase for um, brand ads by firm fixed but um, not much going on maybe slightly negative for, for non-brand ads um, you know there's a there's a number of different ways you can look at our data and um, it, or you know, models you can estimate and so on the x-axis here we have different ways that you can do it you could do aggregate OLS day by day um, you could do with, with random effects, with fixed effects, you could add different time trends. We you know, have a whole bunch of options. Um, and you know, what, what you see is for some of the results, so say for example, position, all these different methods tell a pretty consistent story. You can see that in the top panel. But for cost per click, you know, the results are pretty model sensitive. And so I don't think we can really say uh, too strongly that, that much happened with respect to, to cost here. Um, so, you know, this kind of results, um, you know, the puzzle of why the suspension of the advertising didn't seem to do too much uh, to firm fixed business isn't that surprising when you see that it didn't really do too much to firm fixed marketing campaigns. Um, but this is kind of like just raises another, another puzzle, which is why did their exit from advertising do so little? Um, you know, I mean, one possibility is that they're not, they weren't nearly as close a competitor as they thought. Um, you know, perhaps they were rarely competing in the, in the same auctions. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, what we have now for data doesn't actually allow us to do this comparison, but I'm working on trying to get the kind of data that would let us make that comparison to see if maybe they just, um, you know, two companies that were fierce competitors, their marketing teams just kind of led to, to them to choose to target on different keywords and they actually weren't really competing that much. Um, you know, a related and not really a mutually exclusive possibility is that um, for the brand ads, uh, sorry, for the non-brand ads, uh, even if they were competing in the same auctions, they, they just weren't in a position to affect each other. So uh, say for positionally, if firm vary was everywhere below firm fixed, their exit from the market, uh, you know, isn't going to change the position of firms fixed, and it's only going to change the, what they're paying if if they were the marginal firm. So there's no no other advertisers in in between, um, and so you know I think that that's another possibility that some auction level data might allow us to get at. So um, so just to to conclude, so for firm vary. Uh, search advertising worked it, it, in the sense that it, it drove new customers to the site that they wouldn't have registered through organic channels 
and the ads are fairly efficient on the order of 66 percent so you know for whatever whatever um, uh, for whatever reason sponsored search ads you know in contrast to the eBay scenario we talked about initially actually were, were an effective way to get new customers um, we don't have any evidence that Firm Very was in a, a kind of prisoner's dilemma with Firm Fixed, where you know they were losing business, and um, you know every customer that Firm Very lost got picked up by Firm Fixed, and because of network effects, you know this was this was uh, going to be a, a, a bad thing for them. Um, you know, it, if, to push the prisoner's dilemma analogy, they don't they don't, they didn't seem to even be talking to the same prosecutor. Um, you know, and I, I think. One of the things that became clear after these two firms merged is that they probably were spending a lot of time thinking about each other uh, when they shouldn't have been, that their campaigns weren't actually really interacting with each other nearly as much as, as each firm thought. And, um, you know, how general that is to other close competitors, it's hard to say, but at least in this case for two large, somewhat typical sponsored search advertisers, um, they could have kind of evaluated their marketing campaigns pretty much independently and not considered this um, the, the, the effects it was having on competitors.